can I encourage you now to turn in God's word to the first epistle of John and chapter four. Well, the last time we were in one John together, we considered the first six verses of chapter four, and we saw the need to test the spirits. The Christian is not to be gullible, accepting and believing just anything. Rather, with Christian discernment, we are to be on our guard against the content of false teaching and the characters of false teachers. Now, we have to remember that John here is writing to a collection of churches in first century uh, Asia Minor. And these churches have been so confused by false teachers. They've been led astray from biblical truth. They don't know what constitutes a real Christian. They have lost sight of the true identity of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In other words, there is so much confusion regarding genuine Christianity. And John writes to help these confused believers. He wants to affirm the true identity of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he also wants to demonstrate how we can know that we are truly joined to God through Jesus Christ. And I don't know if you've noticed as we've traveled through 1 John so far that there are recurring themes. John keeps repeating things and repetition is good for emphasis. But each time, however, he returns to a theme here, he adds something. He elaborates on it further. One of those themes we come across is love. In chapters two and three, he's already said quite a bit about the theme of love. Back in chapter two, he said that the Christian is not to love the world, the material things around us which are passing away. In chapter three, he reminds us that a Christian is a child of God because God has lavished love upon us. And consequently, also in chapter three, the, the Christian should then love one another with a sincere and sacrificial love, not in word only, but in deed and in truth. And now in our passage today in chapter four, we see the theme of love. And this time we see it in a little bit more detail. I've got three things for us to consider from our passage this morning. God's love defined for us. God's love displayed in Christ. And thirdly, God's love demonstrated in us. So firstly, from verses 7 through to 12, let's consider our first point. God's love defined for us. Look at verse 7 and look how it starts. Beloved, let us love one another. And John is warmly uh, returning his readers to that theme of brotherly love, a love for one another. It's as Matthew Henry puts it, John singeth his old song again. There's emphasis, there's repetition. We're to love one another. But this time, John the Apostle shows us how it is possible for you and I to love our fellow believers. He goes on in verse seven there, for love, the love that we need, the love that we are to display, for love is from God. And we're not talking about a shallow or fickle love. A love that is self-centered or self-seeking. I'll love you because of what I can get from you. No, we're being shown a real love. This is agape love. Agape is the Greek word 
for this highest form of love, this unconditional love. And this is the love of God. This love is of God. It's from God. He and he alone is the source of true love. If we want that strong, unconditional, sacrificial love, we're not going to find it here on earth. It's rooted firmly in heaven. Now, the world knows something about love, doesn't it? We have relationships. We have emotional attachment to things, to possessions. And the world may appreciate a measure of love because of God's common grace. But that's only a poor shadow of God's great love. So where does real love come from? Well, John simply answers, from God. God's nature is love. Look at what we read in the next verse, verse 8. God is love. Love isn't just of God, from God. God is love. His very essence, his nature is love. And so any who would reflect this true love is truly connected to God. Look what he says. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Verse 8. Those who do not know God through faith in his son are incapable then of reflecting God's love. Instead, the love that they show is a sentimental love, that worldly love. John says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So John's point is quite simple. You can only display this true love if you know the source of this love personally. We can only then love one another if we are connected to the God of love. And this love is defined further, as John shows us, how sacrificial this love is. Look at verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest, made obvious, evident among us. That God sent his only son into the world, that we might live through him. And so with clear and vivid evidence... God has shown his love is sacrificial, not holding back, sacrificing something, someone very close and dear to him. We know the familiar verse, the famous verse that John uses in his gospel, don't we? For God so loved the world, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so this selfless, this sacrificial love was God's initiative. It's not that God loved us because we loved him. It's not God loving us in response to our love for him. Look at what John says clearly in verse 10. In this is love. Remember, he's defining love for us, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is unconditional love for undeserving sinners. And so out of love for his unlovely people, God chose them, not because they deserved it but only because of his love. If we were to cast our minds back to the Old Testament briefly, and God choosing a people for himself that would represent the people of God going forward even today. And if we were to go to Deuteronomy chapter 7, there we would find Moses reiterating 
uh, this fact to God's people back then. Listen to what he says. Deuteronomy 7 verses 6 and 7. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. And Moses is saying it's not because of anything good in you. It's because God has set his love upon you. And that electing love of God is also a saving love. It's not just that God set his love upon a people who would be his own. They were alienated from him. And because of their sin, they had no connection with God, no fellowship with God, no communion with him. In other words, they didn't know God. And so in order for God to have them as his own, it's one thing to love them. It's another thing to save them by his love. And he would sacrifice his only begotten son in order to save them. And John is describing for us this immense and amazing love of God. We sang about it at the beginning of our service, didn't we? Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. And so the propitiation of our sins is being defined for us. Look at verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another and so how are we to respond to God's love well in response to his great love we are to reflect that love by loving others particularly fellow believers verse 12 loving one another as John has already explained in this epistle is proof that we truly know God and therefore are equipped to fulfill this command to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God's love abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And so in stark contrast to the love of this world, John is defining true love. Unmerited, surprising love, selfless, sacrificial love, electing and saving love. And it all flows from God's loving nature. John wants us to see there is no real love apart from God's love. And this is the sort of love that Christians are called to have for one another. But this love is only possible if we have been born of God, as John says, and know him personally. And so that being so, let me ask some questions this morning. Do you know anything of this true love? Do you know the source of this true love personally? Have you experienced this love? If not, these things will be alien to you because you are still alienated from God because of your sin. How can we know the love of God? How can we enter into a loving relationship with God? Through trusting his son, who was the propitiation, who was the saving sacrifice of our sins. And trusting him means that we will live through him. For those of us who are believers this morning, 
shouldn't this gracious love of God drive us deeper to worship him? And shouldn't it motivate us to love one another? God's love defined for our benefit. Well, secondly, in verses 13 to 17, we see God's love displayed in Christ. God's love displayed in Christ. Look with me at verse 13. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, Christ's death upon the cross, even though it was 2,000 odd years ago, is applied to us. That propitiation of Christ satisfies God's justice. God is just and so has to punish sin. But rather than the sinner paying for their sins in hell for eternity, out of love, the sinless Christ took their punishment when he died on Calvary's cross. And through the work of God's spirit, we're made aware of our sinfulness before a holy God. And we are drawn in repentance and faith. But the work of the Holy Spirit continues in the life of the believer. For he now indwells the forgiven sinner. He is the proof that we are saved and that we truly know God. And are a child of God. Look what he says. By this we know that we abide in him. And he in us. Because he has given us. Of his spirit. And because of this regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14. We have seen. And testify. That the father. Has sent the son to be the saviour of the world. It shouldn't surprise us when people in our world laugh at such a notion, don't agree with such a view. But through the work of God's Holy Spirit, the newly forgiven sinner, the believer in Jesus Christ, has seen and can testify to the fact that God the Father sent God the Son to be the saviour of the world. And it's only by God's grace that we've been able to see and testify to that personally, to know the love of God supremely displayed in Jesus Christ. Think about it. Without the work of God's gracious spirit, we would not have seen our sinfulness. And we wouldn't have appreciated the significance of the cross. And we wouldn't and couldn't understand God's love displayed in Christ. Love. It's in the nature of love to give, isn't it? We express our love by giving. Christmas time, birthdays, anniversaries. Ad hoc gifts, we want to express our love in giving. And because of God's nature, he gave. He sent his son as the saviour of sinners, saving from sin and death and hell, taking upon himself, Jesus Christ, taking upon himself God's wrath for sin. We commenced our service by considering the words of Romans 5 and verse 8. God demonstrates or God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's only our union with Christ that unites us with God. Look at verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Verse 16. So we have come to know and to believe 
the love that God has for us. It's through the spirit that we have come to know really experientially and to believe, to rely upon the love that God has for us. God's spirit has revealed God's love in the death of God's son. Second half of verse 16, God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Because of this wonderful love of God in Jesus Christ, we are held together, connected for time and eternity. But John simply hasn't uh, just defined the love of God. He's showing us where it's chiefly displayed. And that's in the Lord Jesus Christ and his death for sinners upon the cross. And as a result, the believer trusting in Christ can have the assurance that they are God's people, chosen by him, saved by him, and abiding in him. And they can have that assurance through the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit. But for the non-Christian, this supreme example of love should be a great challenge. Where else in the history of humanity do we see such love demonstrated? What in the world can compare to this great act of love? God's love displayed in Christ is the only way that sinners like us can be reconciled with the holy God of justice. And Jesus Christ is the only saviour, the saviour that you need. And so that being so, call upon him, trust him, entrust yourself to him and come to know the love of God personally. Then and only then will you know the reality of Paul's words to the Ephesians. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. God hasn't just declared his love for sinners in word only. He has clearly displayed his love in Christ, the saviour of sinners. Well, thirdly and finally this morning, let's look at verses 17 to 21. And there we see God's love demonstrated in us. God's love demonstrated in us. The Christian knows what true love is because they come to know the source of love. They can see and testify to the fact that God's love is vividly displayed in Jesus Christ. And knowing the reality of Christ taking their penalty, the Christian need not fear the judgment of God. Christ has taken the penalty. He has borne our sins in his own body on the tree. And so the believer's confidence is drawn from Christ's atoning sacrifice applied by the Holy Spirit. And this confidence not in ourselves, not in our good works, but this confidence in Christ perfects our love for God. The Christian's assurance then is evidence 
that our love for God is being made complete. By this is love perfected or made complete with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. What an awful day of reckoning the judgment will be. The God who sees all and knows all will hold all accountable. No wonder the writer to the Hebrews tells us it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. To know that our sins that have separated us from God in this life will keep us from God and his heaven for eternity and must be paid for in eternity. What a chilling and sobering thought. But the Christian, through the love of God, has been spared hell and granted heaven. And although we are far from perfect, we are slowly being sanctified, changed, molded into the image of Christ. And even though there's so much progress to be made, we know that we are children of God by adoption. And we know that we can call God, Almighty God, our Father. And that's the same privilege that Christ has in that unique relationship there. Jesus as the Son of God living and walking and talking upon planet Earth, addressed Almighty God as Father. And John says we enjoy the same confidence, the same acceptance as Christ does. As he is, so also are we in the world. And as a result, of knowing a God of love as our heavenly father. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love, complete love, casts out fear. Now remember, God's love is made complete when we are relying and gaining confidence from Christ's death for our sins. And so a complete love trusting only in Christ for salvation, there's no need to fear. John tells us where fear comes from. Look at what he says. For fear has to do with punishment. So if we say we love God, as many religious people do in our world today, if we say we love God but are afraid to come into his presence, it's because we fear his punishment, for our sins hinder us. What did Adam and Eve do in the Garden of Eden when they realized they'd sinned? They were afraid to come into God's presence, so they hid. And yet, if we have confidence, not in ourselves, but in the Savior who has taken away our sins, we do not need to be afraid. John says, whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now, that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't fear God is in respect and have a holy reverence for God. But we're not trembling in the corner, quaking in our boots from God. He is our heavenly father. In other words, a religious person who claims to love God but has not truly experienced the forgiveness of sin, their fear proves that they have not relied upon Jesus Christ for their eternal salvation. And God's love demonstrated in us is that growing sense of confidence in the light of judgment day. God's love demonstrated in us is the assurance the believer knows and enjoys that their heaven is guaranteed 
through trusting Jesus Christ. That being so, can I ask, do you fear passing from this world and facing God in judgment? Or do you know the joy of sins forgiven, peace with God, and the assurance of a home in heaven? But there is another way that God's love is demonstrated in the life of a Christian, not just in confidence and in assurance. Look at verse 19. We love because he first loved us. Because of God's initiative in loving us, we are brought into a relationship with him. And knowing and enjoying that great love, we are then to share that love, express that love, and we are able to do so with the same real love. We are able to love others. It is only because we are truly loved by God that we can truly love others. And just as fear is incompatible, the fear of judgment is incompatible with genuine Christianity, so too is a hatred of others. Verse 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. A true love for God without a love for others is false. John says that person is a liar. Listen to his rationale behind that. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. In other words, how can you love God in heaven when you don't even love those who are around you, who are visible to you? We are deluded if we claim to love God, but it's not accompanied by an unselfish and practical love for our brothers and sisters. So rather than fear characterizing a Christian, love should be our hallmark. Love should characterize you and I. Verse 21, this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. There's an imperative there. It's inseparable. We must love one another. Do you love God? Then love your fellow Christian with the same love that God has lavished upon you. Can't love a fellow Christian? Find it hard to love someone? Examine your heart and see whether you are truly uh, loving God and trusting in that supreme demonstration of love in Christ. You see, when we put love in perspective, that helps us to love one another. Love demonstrated in the life of a Christian is further evidence of genuine Christianity. There's a natural and positive outworking of God's love in the believer then, demonstrated in our life and experience. That love helps us with assurance, knowing we're accepted, knowing we're going to heaven. That love helps us with one another. That love helps us identify us as God's children. So here in our passage, verses 7 to 21, we've seen three important truths concerning the love of God. Truths that should challenge us, truths that should comfort us and conform us to whether we are God's children. Three things then. God's love defined for us. God's love displayed in Christ, God's love demonstrated in us. Jesus said, 
if you love me, you will keep my commands. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you that your love has been displayed in your word. It's been defined in the Bible. But we thank you that it's chiefly displayed in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of us who know you and trust you through your son, we pray that we might with greater confidence, with greater measure, display this love, demonstrate it to others. We thank you, our Heavenly Father, that this love grants to us assurance. And so we would pray for those who fear you. Draw them to yourself, we pray, that they may rely on Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation and escape the judgment of God. And so, our Heavenly Father, we think of the words of the hymn. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>